Here we are. It's the physics video lecture, physics 2A, video lecture 33. And today I'm going to do a bunch of review problems because I had quite a few students asking to do this, that, and the other problem. So let's see what we have. People wanted to see quiz number eight and nine and a bunch of problems out of chapter eight. So that's what I'll do today. And then after the, so next time we'll resume the fluid mechanics. So right now we're doing review and starting with quiz eight. So the eight quiz quiz eight. So on the eighth quiz, we launched a car with a spring-loaded contraption at car one, and it strikes a second car that is at rest. So car two is at rest, and then they stick together and continue on. And we want to know the final speed. Okay. So it's then we have two cars here moving together, one and two. So, I think that's what the problem was. The spring contains a certain amount of potential energy, which I just called W, because I didn't give any specifics about the spring. So it had so and so many joules, but we know that that was going to turn into one half mv squared. That's the work turning into kinetic energy, and that would have been m1 v1 squared. Okay, so that would have been the first equation. After the collision, or for the collision, we have conservation of linear momentum, so we have m1 v1 is m1 plus m2 v prime. And so now I can solve for v prime, which is what I'm looking for. That's m1 divided by m1 plus m2. So 1. And I have to multiply that by the v1 in this equation here. So that would be 2 times the work. 2 times w divided by m1 and I need the square root of that. So this expression can be simplified a bit, but it, this is the answer here. And we were given the work, stored energy, and the two masses on this problem. Good, so there you have it. That was quiz eight. Quiz nine was related here we had a car that was already moving. I'll indicate its motion like that. And it's going to collide with a second car that's at rest. And this is, of course, M1 and V1. It's going to collide with a second car that's at rest. And they're going to stick together and roll up the hill and reach some final height. Right. So you recognize that's just the ballistic pendulum problem. So what do we have here? We have before and after the collision, just like up there, M1, V1, M1 plus M2, V prime, so I'll call that my first equation. And the second part, after the collision, this thing is moving, and we're going to have, um, well, I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and write it out in terms of energy. So one half M1 plus M2 V prime squared, that's the kinetic energy, and it turns into potential, comes to a stop, and there's M1 plus M2. G H. Of course, with some practice, you don't have to actually write those M1 and M2 down. So we have H is equal to 
three primes that we're divided by two g. So I've got one divided by two g and my v prime squared, that's that m1 v1, m1 plus m2, that's my v prime from equation one and that squared. So there's this, the answer to the second problem or to quiz number nine. Good. Then I have a whole list of homework problems out of chapter eight. So I'm just going to take them in numerical order here. Let's see what we have. Problem 47. Forty-seven was that uniform thin rod. Okay, yeah, this was a an interesting topic, and we're looking for angular acceleration. Yeah, here, just go ahead and erase this first. draw this scenario first. There is on some kind of a hinge here, there is a uniform rod like that, okay, supported. So if you let go of this thing, it can swing through. And total length L, total mass M. I'm just going to write M and L here. And I'll indicate the center of mass at the center there. And what we're told is that it's released from rest in the horizontal position. And we're really just analyzing it right here. What I did in class was we, we had one released from rest and we talked about it swinging through, okay? But it's just released from rest and now we're talking about that instant. And so let's go ahead and look at what the equations are. Okay. So it's going to swing through, okay? But we're really just talking about this instant here. Okay, so we have tau is equal to I alpha, that's Newton's law for rotational motion, torque, moment of inertia, angular acceleration. And if we want to talk about the linear accelerations, we use alpha times R is equal to A. So those would be the tangential acceleration. I'm, I'm just calling R a length because we're gonna have different lengths involved right here. So good. What do we have for part A? The rod's angular acceleration. So that's not bad at all. Angular acceleration is the torque over the moment of inertia. And the torque is going to be you know, we have mg acting right there, okay? So that torque is going to be force times lever arm, which is L over two. Okay. And then there will be the moment of inertia of that rod. Look it up in the book about the pin right there. So that's going to be the answer. And of course, you always want to get this expressed in terms of all the values, and including the moment of inertia in terms of the mass and the length before you plug any numbers in. Okay. Good, then on part B, the tangential acceleration of the rod's center of mass, and part C, tangential acceleration of the rod's free end. So you have to have this alpha here. Then for B, I'm gonna write A tangential is equal to this alpha L over two. And for part C, this is a B, for part C, A tan, let's back up. For part C, A tangential will be this alpha that we just found times the entire length because 
we're looking at this thing. Perfect. You know, I release this and it swings down, but at the very instant I release it, there's an angular acceleration and a linear acceleration at these two respective points. It's just letting something swing through. Good. So yeah, very important to calculate this here. In fact, I think that's ML squared over 3. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to always memorize these things. So yeah, looking for the moment of inertia of the uniform rod. Let's see here. Isn't there a table of these? Yeah. Yeah, one third ML squared. So we can continue this over here. We're going to have M, G, we're going to have L divided by 2. 2 is the denominator. And then we're going to have one third ML squared. So then if you carefully look at this, M goes away on both the tier. We have G, we have L over L squared, so we have an L right here, and we have three halves. Three halves. So three G over two L. Okay. That's what we get for the angular acceleration. And we multiply that by L over two. Um, and by L over. Okay, so we would have the three G over two L. Um, L over two. So the linear acceleration is going to be, what's interesting is you get linear accelerations that are greater than G, okay? If you just did something in free fall, you just get G. So this fact that it's a rigid body gives you those greater linear accelerations, which is at the root of the explanation for why those towers that tip over actually snap on the way down. We have some good pictures of that on the homework, by the way. Okay, so let's leave that and do another problem. Seventy one. L over 2, 1 third ML squared. Let's just, okay. So the M's cancel. We have 3G as before, 2L. Okay, yeah, you know what, I'm going to continue this just to make sure I explicitly make the point that I was talking about since we're on the subject. So yeah, let's finish this up with part B and C. So now, and then I'll raise this. For part B, we have the tangential acceleration. It's that alpha 3G over 2L times L over 2, and we end up with 3 quarters G, 2, 3 quarters times G. Okay, so that's less than G, no problem. 
but if we do this at the end, so part C was asking about the linear acceleration of the end. We now have the 3G over 2L times L. And now the L's cancel, we end up with 3 halves G, which is say 1.5 times G. Okay, so the end of that thing is accelerating with greater acceleration than G. Good, so that, I want to make sure that point, right? This is less than G, okay, but this is actually greater than G, and that's the important point. Okay, good, so now let's move on to problem, what do we say here, 71. Let's see what was asked on problem 71. Yeah, 71 is the central force table, we like to call it. <clears throat> and what we're going to do is pull on the string that comes out the bottom of this table. So there's the profile here. You have a frictionless mass whirling around on a table. How about a second color here? I'm going in a circle, there's R, and I'm going to pull on this thing, and as I pull on it, the circular motion is going to get smaller. So let's see what they gave us. They had a mass here, that's fine, of this smooth object. We have a mass. They gave us the mass, they gave us the original radius, gave us the original speed. Good. So M comma R sub 1 comma V sub 1. That's what's given. And now we're going to pull the string down and ask how much work we did in pulling it down because you're going to feel a tension in the string because this thing's going in a circle. Circular motion. You feel a tension as you pull down on it you're going to swing it in and it's going to whirl around faster. So the hint is, is that we want to use the work kinetic energy theorem. So the work that we do is going to be the difference or the change in the kinetic energy. It's going to be one half mv2 squared minus one half mv1 squared. Okay. It's the work kinetic energy theorem. And V2 is going to be greater than V1 because it's going to whirl around faster. Now, what makes it whirl around faster is that we have conservation of angular momentum. So we have conservation of angular momentum. I'll use the letter L is equal to MVR. This is constant as we pull on the string. So that's M. I'll, use, I'll, I'll write it in the order RV, but same thing. So it's M R1 V1 equals M R2 V2. So this equation here is the key because they gave us the V1 so we can solve for V2. V2 equal to, masses cancel, R1 V1 divided by R2. And since R2 is less than R1, this V2 is going to be greater. And now everything is known. We can plug these things in here. Um, won't be too complicated. So the work we're looking for is equal to one half M and the V2 is going to be R1 over R2 V1 squared V2 squared and minus V1 squared minus V1 squared 
So this can even be simplified a little bit more if you're interested. Yeah, but before I even go on, the physics was this work kinetic energy theorem on the one hand, and the second ingredient was the conservation of annual momentum. So go ahead and write that down in words. Work kinetic energy theorem right here, and conservation of angular momentum right there. I should have written it down, but you guys can write it down now. Work kinetic energy, conservation of angular momentum, and then my final simplification of this result you know the, the book gave centimeters and what have you that's up to you guys so yeah the answer is we have a half m v1 squared I can factor that out and then I have r1 over r2 squared minus 1 Good. So yeah, that's a very interesting problem. And what else do we have? Problem 73. Okay, yeah, remember 73 I talked about when I assigned it. Ratio of the final initial kinetic energy. Yeah, this problem with the, so this problem number 73, this is these two disks, one rotating, falls on the other one. One's rotating, which one is rotating? The bottom one. So this is, uh, this one is rotating, it has. I1 omega 1. This one has I2 omega 2 is 0. The, the problem works exactly like the perfectly inelastic collision. And so the calculation is formally the same. So what we have is conservation of angular momentum. I'll write it down this time. Conservation of angular momentum so we have i1 omega 1 is equal to i1 plus i2 omega you know we i would write omega prime okay the book just wrote omega so this is our first equation and then they want to know something about the kinetic energy well, it's being lost in the same way it was when we called this M1, V1 equals M1 plus M2, V prime. Okay, everything is going to work the same. So kinetic energy final is equal to 1 half I1 plus I2 omega. We might call it omega prime because that's what I always do. Omega prime squared and kinetic energy initial is equal to one half I one omega one squared, right? And my omega prime is yeah. Omega prime that we get out of the second equation. So ratios, differences, and anything else you want are just obtained using these equations here. What did they ask us for? the ratio of the final to the initial kinetic energy. So the final divided by the initial. We can do that. this whole thing by one half I1 
of Mariko Park Square. So you can see the Omega Squares are already gone. Okay. The one halves we can of course strike. And then we'll have I1 squared divided by I1, and I1 plus I2 divided by I1 plus I2 squared. So we're going to end up with I1 divided by I1 plus I2. Okay, it's going to be less than 1. And you know, write this down carefully and make sure you see this algebra, okay? So you can, put a, you can leave a few more lines in your work and make sure you get this. Good, so that was problem 73. Two more on my list. Let's see how much time we've taken. Fantastic, we got nothing but time. Okay, so I have two more problems on the list. And one of them is problem 81, okay, which is a symbolic version of problem 80. This is actually a good one too, so I'll go ahead and erase this. So we have two astronauts connected by a rope and they're out there weightless out there in outer space. Let's see what we have here. We don't care about their masses. We don't care about any numbers. This is a good problem. D space circles. Speed V. Fantastic. So here we go. We have two astronauts. They're connected by a rope, so there's a distance D separating them. They each have mass M, and there's their center of mass. And their speed is V, so they're going in a circle. Can I indicate their circular orbit? You get it. So they're, they're circling each other, or they're circling this center of mass point there. So the angular momentum of that system is two, because there's two of them, the mass times d over two times v, okay? Two of them, it's just the mass times the length times the speed. We talked about that when we reduced the moment of inertia to the, the point mass version, okay? So, Let's go ahead. We could also say L is equal to I omega. So what would I omega be? Moment of inertia of this system here would be two, because again, there's two of them, M D over two squared. Okay. Distance m d over 2 squared, and then there's two of them there. Okay, what would the omega be? We know omega times d over 2 is v. So the omega would be 2v over d. And when the dust settles on this one, we have 2m d squared over 4 times 2 v divided by d. And what do you know? 2, 2 is 4, m, v, d. Okay. So we get the same thing. 2's cancel on this one, m times v times d. So angular momentum is just m times v times d for this system. And it is conserved. 
Why is the angular momentum conserved? So conserve angular momentum. The reason is, is the two astronaut system cannot in, uh, cannot produce an external torque. All they can do is pull on that rope. They can't spin themselves up. You know, externally, someone externally to them, or if they had a rocket blaster in their hand, they could spin themselves up more with an added force. But the reason that angular momentum is conserved is there's no net external force. These are just internal forces that they're pulling on each other with the rope. So this is conserved. So what's going to happen if they pull on the rope and try to come towards each other, they're going to. Um, decrease the separation distance and correspondingly increase the speed. There's no way around it. So if they try to get really close to each other, you're going to be spinning like crazy. Okay, that pretty much allows us to calculate anything, anything in here. So part A, the magnitude of the angular momentum I just did, rotational energy of the system, shortening the distance, um, and how much work is done. So the, all of the questions on this problem are very similar to the one with the central force table. Okay. So this was part A, and I'll just go through a couple of them. The rotational energy of the system, that would be the kinetic energy of rotation. But you know, that's just the total initial kinetic energy. So there's two of them, one half, and B squared. So that's what they started with. Now they're going to be able to change that because to pull towards each other, they have to do work. And that work um, gets turned into changing kinetic energy, even though the angular momentum stays the same. So what is the new angular momentum of the system if they shorten the rope to D over two? It's the same. Here's how I'm going to write it. So the new angular momentum, I can call it L prime or something, it's going to be M times 2V times D over 2. Right? They shorten the rope to D over 2, but that makes them speed up with twice the speed. It's still M times D times D. So that's unchanged, but the new speeds the new rotational energy and the work done is just like problem, uh, what was that, 47, just like problem 71, just like problem 71. So C, D, and E, C, problem 71 that we just did. Same thing, angular momentum conserved, work kinetic energy theorem okay, comes into play. Same as that one. Okay, good. So I'll leave that right there. That's a good problem. And you know, at this point and hopefully in the semester, you realize it's so much better to not work with numbers and uh, just work with the expressions here and the symbols. If not, you'll come around eventually. Don't worry. So the last one I want to talk about today is problem 89. And this one we need a careful construction. And this is actually a model of a medieval device used to throw rocks at castles. <laughs> um, so they gave us a bunch of numbers, but I'm going to carefully draw this just with symbols. Here's the device. Uh, pivot. And we're going to call this a. I'm not done drawing it yet. This might take a little bit longer. Okay, here's the longer end. And 
here at the shrine once more. Let's try this again. Here we go. Okay, so this has a large mass, and this has a small mass that's going to be thrown. We're using M1 and M2, so we will as well. So we have M1, M2. But I'm going to go ahead and call this L1 right here, and this L2. Okay. And that's really all we need. And the the rod here, I'll go ahead and make it red just for fun. Okay. This thing is being modeled as massless. So negligible mass compared to these two big end masses. And the idea is if you let go of this thing, it's going to swing up in an arc. And at some point, maybe on the top of the arc, this thing gets launched here. It's supposed to be a rock or something gets launched and flies away. And so for our, our discussion, we just want to know what's the speed up here. You know, when that thing's really moving up here, and what we're going to do is use conservation of energy. Okay. So we're going to use energy. And I like to do energy at A. And uh, yeah, the idea is this thing swings through here. I'll use, I'll use a different color. Swings through. So finally, it's like this. Okay, so the blue is A, and the black here is B. So we can say energy at A equals energy at B. Okay. Um, good. So what is the energy at A? Well, it's at rest. And if I make this be the zero level, let's say there's a y-axis and that's the zero level, I can say the potential energy is zero and the kinetic energy is zero. So what could be simpler than have a zero here? Now at B, we're going to have rotational kinetic energy plus um, potential energy. So I'll write, this is kinetic energy of rotation plus potential energy. And the potential energy is going to be M1GL1, because this thing swings up here. So M1GL1. But this one's lower, so it'll be minus M2G. L2. And M2 is of course going to be much, much larger than M1. But this is exact right now. What about the kinetic energy of rotation? That kinetic energy of rotation is one half I omega squared. And we've got this, um, I can factor out a G for whatever it's worth, G M1, L1 minus M2, L2. So now we have to find omega. So I'm just going to write this down next. Find omega, comma, then V of our little projectile up here will be equal to omega L1. B will be equal to omega L1. So we have to go ahead and figure out what I is. The moment of inertia of that medieval device. But that shouldn't be difficult at all. But you'll also see that you definitely didn't want to plug any numbers in. So you had everything squared away. 
because it will be very transparent. Okay, so the moment of inertia, remember it's the sum of masses times distances squared. So it's m1 l1 squared plus m2 l2 squared. And then we've got G, M1, L, oops, needed a one up here. Minus M2, L2. Up, loss, and we've got the omega squared there. There we go. So this is one equation. In one unknown, you can solve for omega. And then V is equal to omega L1. for omega comma then v is equal to omega l1 and I'm going to declare victory right there because this is just a you know just a big equation um, anything else I should actually do the trick F I omega squared. So you can bring this to the other side, switch the order of these, divide, so forth. Well, since I'm here, we have omega squared is equal to 2G M2 L2 minus M1 L1 okay, divided by m1 l1 squared plus m2 l2 squared. Good, and you take the square root of that. And you see the functionality really depends upon m2 being, you know, m2 times l2 being much greater than m1 times l1. That's what it all boils down to. Good, so this gives us our omega, take the square root, multiply by this, and you get your L1. So actually, square root of this expression times L1. Oh. Times L1. There you go. Okay, good. Let's see. That's what was on my list. That was on my list, and I think we're going to call it a day. So I'm not, I'm not going to assign anything new today. Next time, we'll be back into Chapter 9 with all of the uh, fluid statics and then moving on to the fluid dynamics. But yeah, make sure you include these in your notes and make sure you understood them. But definitely a good uh, review and repeat. All right, see you next time.